if you can save five seconds off a task, let's say mixing soil, then and you're growing one tray, it's five seconds. It's not a big deal. You're not really saving that much time. But when you're growing 100 trays, you're saving uh, 500 seconds. And when you're growing 1,000 trays, you're saving 5,000 seconds. And that's just one five second change to your operation. So, uh, and if you multiply it by a year, you're talking about like a lot of time. So you can really uh, save a lot of time and make your operation more efficient by making small changes. Welcome to the MyGreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving MyGreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest MyGreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we are answering your questions from social media, everything from insurance for microgreens businesses, soil alternatives to ProMix, how to make an effective sales brochure, and so much more. Stay tuned. We have a great episode for you today. Let's get right into it. So the first question is, I've grown several trays of buckwheat and it grows really well. Do you think there's a market for that microgreen and have you ever tried it? So first off, yeah, I have tried growing buckwheat. I grew it in the early years when I was uh, starting out back in 2013. And I only grew it for about a year uh, for multiple reasons. The first one is the hulls are really a pain to get off. They are, they really stick a lot more than cilantro or beets or um, sunflower. So they're a lot harder to, to get off is what I found. And uh, they're a beautiful microgreen. They taste really good, but there's just not a whole lot of demand for them. And I've seen over the years, the last decade of building my microgreens business that they just became less and less popular. It's almost very similar with wheatgrass where it became much less popular as years went on. When I started growing microgreens in 2013, 2012, or 2012, but 2013 is when I started the business, wheatgrass was like a really popular product. And now it's, you know, you'll see it here and there, but it's not, there's nowhere near as much demand for it. And same thing with buckwheat. I very rarely see, I see it even less than wheatgrass now. So it's become really out of uh, style in a way. And broccoli microgreens and cilantro and things like that have really taken its place as the more popular dominant uh, popular microgreen. So while there might be a market for you, uh, my guess is in most places I've seen it, it's going to be a lot smaller than it used to be. So the way I think of it is it's always best to, um, you know, when there's fads, I don't follow them, but when there's trends, it makes sense to follow trends. So the trend is like things like broccoli microgreens have been growing in popularity and things like buckwheat and wheatgrass have been declining in popularity. So it's always a lot easier to capture a market that's growing than a market that's shrinking. So while you, it may be worth it to try, uh, I don't think there's going to be a large market for it. So um, if I were to be in your shoes, I probably wouldn't grow it for commercial sale, but maybe for uh, personal consumption, it's a great microgreen and it's you know high yielding and the colors are really beautiful. Um, the stem is a beautiful pink stem. Uh, if you grow it with strong lights, that's really important for a crop like that, then it's great for personal consumption. So it's worth it to try, but I don't think there's going to be a big market for it. Next question is, what advice would you give a new microgreens business owner in regards to finding a suitable insurance provider? Um, this is a good question. So it's not net, like there's no requirement that you have to have insurance as a microgreens business, at least as far as I know. Um, there may be local areas that require that. You may find some customers require that, like liability insurance is something you should definitely have, uh, whether it's required or not, because if someone you know, God forbid, got sick from your product, you want to protect your assets. So you definitely want to have some sort of liability insurance. And again, this is generally not necessarily required, but it's just a good thing to have. And it's generally pretty affordable, especially if you're growing like very, very small scale. Usually the cost of the insurance is somewhat proportional to how much product you're selling for liability insurance. So as my farm grew, my liability insurance costs went up. And as you know, when it was a smaller business, then there was, you know, it was a, a very low cost. So um, in terms of finding a suitable insurance provider, not every insurance provider is going to want to insure an agriculture, like, cause it really is an agricultural farm business. So you want to find a broker generally is the best way to do it. Because if you have a broker, then they'll, they'll go to like, you know, 10, 20 different insurance providers 
get the quotes and then give you the best options. So that's the easiest way is if you just find a local uh, business insurance broker in your area, which there'll be dime a dozen and, uh, and you can even call a few of them and then get quotes on the, the insurance from different companies and kind of pick which one is the lowest cost slash has the best uh, insurance coverage for what you want. Because sometimes you may not only be able to get liability as an example, sometimes you can, but it depends on the insurance provider. So if that's all you want, then it'll probably be lower cost, but you'll have to go with specific providers. So um, a broker is the best way to do that. And I highly recommend contacting them just, just to get a sense of what is provided and what the costs are. Next, do you stack trades during germination? Yes, this is a really, really important part of the growing process for microgreens. So um, there's only one crop that you don't stack, which is in my experience, which is basil, you can stack it. It just, you have more issues with it. Um, but every other crop I've seen benefits from being stacked. And the reason it benefits is when you have multiple trays on top of each other, if you don't stack them, what's gonna happen is you have all these seeds that are really densely planted in your tray. And some of the roots are gonna go down. Some of the roots are gonna go sideways and some of them are gonna go even slightly up because their their tendency is to go down, but they're competing against all these other seeds that are close by for that soil space. So if you, when you stack them, it puts pressure on uh, the seeds and then they're much better able to orient downwards, which is where you want their roots. Because if they're not stacked and they orient sideways and then you put them under lights, those uh, seeds are most likely gonna die. So you're gonna have a much lower germination rate than you would if you stack them. So it's a really simple process. Um, I've found that you can stack anywhere from like four to six uh, in, in one stack and then just put some sort of weight. Some people use bricks, some people use uh, sandbags, whatever really works, but you just wanna get some, some weight on those seeds so that they orient downwards and um, specific crops like as an example sunflower or peas really benefit from this because you're planting them so densely that they literally need that weight to be able to uh, orient downwards so really important step very simple though uh, but really important so definitely you want to stack your trays during germination for the vast majority of crops that you're going to grow when creating a brochure or informational webpage for microgreens, what information would you feel is best to spread the word and educate people about microgreens? So this is, this is a really good question. Um, you, what you really want is to keep things simple. So you don't want like a ton, you don't want like, you know, an essay of information on your website or on your brochure. You wanna just like really hit on the main points. So um, if you're growing organically, you want to touch on that. You want to touch on that you're growing locally, that your quality is, um, is, is really good. So you want to kind of show pictures of your product, uh, whether it's packaging or just the actual trays growing. Um, you want to include, uh, definitely some sort of information about yourself. So like, like what is your, why, why are you growing microgreens? Why did you start this business? Um, so you want to definitely include something like that. So if I were to make my own, I would talk about how I'm really passionate about, uh, you know, feeding people the highest quality, most nutrients and foods, because I want people to be healthy and be able to enjoy all the other aspects of their life. So, you know, you'd obviously board it a bit differently than that, but you want to kind of just tell your story of what, why you're doing it. Maybe if you had some sort of, uh, health issue and that's why you got into microgreens because you found out about the health benefits, talk about that briefly, um, in just a short summary of you know, who you are, because I think that helps connect you to the people purchasing your microgreens or buying your food. Um, and people want to know who their, farmer is, who their farmer is. So uh, it's definitely a benefit to include that. You definitely want to design it nicely, whether it's your webpage or a brochure. So you want it to be like sleek and clean, but have uh, the right information. So, um, you know, you can talk about the health benefits of microgreens, but you don't want to like, you know, again, you don't want to have like an essay worth of information on that. Just like bullet points, like microgreens are four to 40 times more nutrient dense. Um, they're grown locally and, uh, you know, they, they have a much better flavor profile than uh, mature greens. They last longer in your fridge. So you'll have less waste, just like the general points of what you're trying to, to sell. And obviously if you have something that's unique in the market, whether that's a product or the way you operate your business, Definitely highlight that because you want to distinguish yourself from any other growers in your area and have a unique feature or selling point or why people should purchase from you rather than someone else. So the way you want to think of it is if you have, let's say there's three other people just hypothetically in your area um, and you were the customer and you got this brochure, what on this brochure is going to sell you on 
uh, purchasing my greens from you. So it could be a relatable story. It could be the product offering, could be the price. So you want to really try to sell, um, you know, why people should buy the product from you rather than someone else and just use the approach of being in the shoes of the customer and seeing if it works on you. If it works on you, then it's more likely to work on others. And then the next thing you want to do is give that brochure or show your website to some friends and family that will give you actual honest feedback, which is really important. So you don't want people to just like tell you, oh yeah, it's great, it's great, it's great. You really want people that you trust will give you honest feedback. And if they see there's something that doesn't make sense or um, that they think can be improved, that they'll actually tell you. And that'll be a good starting point for um, ensuring you have the best uh, information and quality brochure and website before you're actually uh, giving it out to potential customers. What suggestions do you have for being more efficient when mixing soil and making trays as you grow up to 100 tray count per week? So as you get a larger, larger scale with growing microgreens, efficiency becomes more and more important. If you can save five seconds off a task, let's say mixing soil, then, and you're growing one tray, it's five seconds, not a big deal. You're not really saving that much time, but when you're growing a hundred trays, you're saving uh, 500 seconds. And when you're growing a thousand trays, you're saving 5,000 seconds. And that's just one five second change to your operation. So, uh, and if you multiply it by a year, you're talking about like a lot of time. So you can really uh, save a lot of time and make your operation more efficient by making small changes so you don't necessarily need to have like big changes where you have to have a soil mixing machine. While that is very beneficial, um, it's just not practical for a lot of small scale farms. So what you really want to do is think of your operation as a factory. So uh, you think about your manufacturing a product. What would you do to make it most efficient? So as an example, you don't want to mix the soil in your garage, uh, seed in your basement, and then grow your trays upstairs. You want it to be in a uh, in a line so you're not going up and down up and down as an example if you can avoid that so ideally what you want to do is you'd want to um if you're doing it in your house you would want to mix your soil in your garage seed in your garage water in your garage carry them up once to your grower area and ideally if you can harvest in your grower area um, or close to it and that way you're not like going up and down for processes, you're going in a in a, a straight line. Now, ideally, you want th these things to be as close as possible. So, where you're mixing soil, ideally, you want it to be as close as possible to where you're growing, because then there's less less movement, and that movement surprisingly will will add up to a lot more time than you think. So, that's just from like an operations perspective. There's so many of these little things that can really speed up production. And this is kind of the stuff I get into in consulting. Is I, I kind of take a look at people's operations, say, okay, hey. This is how you can make it more efficient based on my experience. And this is what will save you quite a bit of time and get you either higher quality product, more profitability, or just simply improving uh, the speed and efficiency of your operation. Um, now, when it comes to uh, mixing soil and making trays, a few other things you can do is um, you want to have something to break up the bales. So you may not be able to buy a soil mixing machine. Totally understand those things are pretty expensive. But there's cheap tools that you can purchase that will allow you to not have to physically break up the soil by, uh, by hand. So there's uh, uh, soil cultivators that they can be battery powered, maybe $100, $200, and they pretty much have tines and they just turn back and forth. And then instead of having to break up with your hand, you have a, me a mechanized tool that can actually break up those compressed bales. So that's the first thing I would do. Um, so I don't have to you know, physically break up the soil by hand. Um, you can use a cement mixer, which is a pretty relatively inexpensive tool to actually mix the soil. Um, so if you're adding anything like the fertilizer that I recommend for the super soil recipe, uh, that's a way to mix the soil and not have to do that by hand. Uh, in terms of filling trays, if you have a big, large uh, bucket or, or tote, and then you have like some sort of screen on top, then you can kind of put the, um, put the soil on the tray, shake it off, and then the soil will fall down into the bin below and uh, and having that mesh screen will allow you to have the tray stay flat and be super easy to get the excess soil off. So these kind of things are, are really what make a difference at a small scale when you start growing 100 trays or more per week. So there's so many of these suggestions. I could probably make an episode just on this alone, but those are some quick suggestions on what you can do to make your soil mixing and tray filling uh, part of, of your operation more efficient. Can you explain your process for cleaning trays? Do you soak them or spray them and rinse? 
Um, so the process for cleaning trays is pretty straightforward. I wish I had this information when I started because this would have saved me so many headaches with managing disease because I used to take the dirty trays with soil on them, dunk them in my disinfecting solution and wonder why I'm still getting disease. And it was only when I spoke to an expert in the field that kind of told me like, hey, if you have soil on your trays and you put disinfecting on them, there is a, a point of contact where the plastic meets the, the soil that's left on the tray. And in between that, the disinfecting solution can't get there. So the bacteria can stay there, breed, and keep uh, uh, reproducing. So uh, the most important, biggest change I ever made to my disinfecting regimen was to get rid of all soil and, and soil seed and root residue first, then disinfect your tray. And there's a few ways you can disinfect your tray. Some people prefer to spray them on both sides uh, with just a pump sprayer. And, and uh, that's great when you're only growing, when you're only doing a few trays, but as you get larger scale, if you're doing hundreds and hundreds of trays, having a tote and then putting the disinfecting solution in that tote and then dunking the trays is a much faster way to do that because you can do potentially 50 trays at a time rather than uh, one at a time. So it's way, way faster. But the downside is you have to use more disinfecting solution. So it will cost you more in solution, but uh, will save you a lot of time. And you'll see this is a theme in running a microgreens business and just in life is you have this conflict between money and time. You can pay for things and, and save time, or you can spend more time and save your money. So it just depends on what stage you're at in your business. Uh, I'm at a point uh, and I got at a point pretty fast with my business where time was more valuable than money. So I started spending on things like automation equipment, uh, automatic watering system, uh, harvester, uh, hiring staff, like all the things that allow me to have more time to do things and spend the money to have other people or have machines do those processes for me. So uh, everyone gets to this point in their business where it's like you only have so much time in your day that to do things. And there's a certain point where you have to start either paying someone or get machines or a combination of both to do the work for you to be able to continue to scale your business. And people that don't do that um, and continue to run at full capacity will burn out. There's, I can guarantee you that, that um, if you're running a business and your time is completely full, you don't have extra time to grow the business or to spend on sales and things like that. And you're just managing production and keeping up with the day to day you will eventually burn out because you. this is a business that takes uh, can take a lot of your time if not done in the most efficient and uh, conscious way in terms of like planning what makes the most sense for long term, uh, you will likely burn out. So it's really, really important to have these things in place prior to having a major expansion because it will allow you to have a much better one quality of life and to have enough time to have leisure time, spend time with family and friends and not be 100% running the business all the time, which can work for a year or two, but I can guarantee you, if you try to do that for five or 10 years, uh, you will uh, age yourself significantly and you likely will have a much tougher time being able to run the business because you know you inevitably get, like everyone gets sick, everyone gets uh, the flu here and there and gets colds and has you know uh, uh, family events to need, that they need to go to or weddings or whatever it may be. So uh, it's much better to plan that out to have a better balance of life and running your business. Um, and I know I'm getting off topic here, but I think it's an important point for uh, those of you that are starting your business to kind of keep that in mind, just be intentional about how you're spending your time in your business and, uh, and to have a plan of how to make your business more efficient so that not all of your time is being spent in the business, but you have uh, a life outside of running your microgreens farm. Next question. Do you think it's better to water right before turning lights on, kind of like watering early in the morning for a garden, or do you find it doesn't really make much of a difference? So when you take your trays out of germination, it's really important that you bottom water them right away. So, uh, and the reason for that is because the trays aren't gonna be at full saturation or they might be low on water in certain spots because they were in germination, they weren't um, bottom watered yet. So the first bottom watering is really important to be done right away once they go under lights. Um, after that, it really doesn't matter. So like if you're, if you're doing germination and you want to mist your crops in the morning, by all means do that, but there's no difference. As long as you do it consistently, that's really the most important thing. So you don't necessarily need to do it, um, at a specific time of the day. It's just that it's done consistently along your schedule. So you don't like, if you're watering, let's say every other day, you don't want to water in the morning on the first time and then water at, you know, before you go to bed 
on the two days later, because that's much more than two days, unless that's a schedule that works, uh, you know, you, you're watering every two and a half days as an example. But if, you, if you're planning to water every two days, you want to water, let's say you water 10 a.m., you want to water approximately at 10 a.m. two days from now. And that just keeps things consistent. And that's one thing that I think is really important for migraines businesses is it's everything's very routine. So you want to be able to find your routine, find your groove and how you do things and do what works for you. You don't have to uh, water your crops in the morning if it, if you prefer to water them in the evening. It really doesn't matter as long as things can, are consistent because if they're consistent, then you actually keep up with the schedule. If you water in the morning and then sometimes you water at midday and sometimes you water at night, uh, it may, it may uh, not form the routine in yourself and then you may forget to water. So there is software that can help you with that, like Vertigro's uh, Farmware that can give you the um, task sheet to do every day. So it'll tell you, okay, water, water this crop, water that crop, whatever it may be. Um, start start these trays today and seed broccoli twenty trays today, that sort of thing. So it can help you keep you on task and on schedule. Um, but it's not going to really make a difference if you water at night or during the day, as long as you keep things consistent. So that's the most important thing with watering um, and to, to obviously get a sense of how much water the crops need at the beginning stage. So once once you've grown for a couple of months, you'll have a pretty good sense of that. So you can just make a schedule and stick to that schedule. And then you'll have a consistent crop every single time you grow, which makes life a lot easier. And the last question is, do you have another recommendation for soil? I'm having a hard time seeing the return on my crop paying $110 a bag for ProMix. Um, so yes, there are some alternatives. Um, you should be able to get ProMix less expensive than that. So if you go to your local hydroponic store or garden center, you should be able to find ProMix HP uh, for much less than that. It should be somewhere around 50, maybe $60 max. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, when you say you have a hard time seeing a return paying $110 a bag, um, even at that price point, you would still have a, a very profitable microgreens business. Now, I don't recommend paying that much because you can get a lot less. And if you're not sure if your operation is profitable, the best recommendation is to go to our website, microgreensconsulting.com, and we have a microgreens cost calculator that'll help you determine what your actual profit margins are. And it's a really great tool that can help you actually determine what you're making per tray or per clamshell that you're selling of microgreens. Uh, because a lot of people kind of go in blind, just like, okay, microgreens are profitable. But you really want to know how profitable they are so that as you scale your business, if you say, let's say you're about to expand your business and you want to... Uh, uh, 4x your production. If you 4x your production and you're growing four times the amount of trays, you can figure out how much profitability you're going to have with this cost calculator because you can just uh, extrapolate that out based on the different trays you're growing, different crops you're growing, uh, what that will equate to. So you have to do a little bit of more manual work to figure that those kind of numbers out. But having said that, it gives you the base foundation to figure that out. So um, definitely recommend that because even at $110 a bag, assuming all your other costs are in line with what they should be, you would still have a profitable microgreens farm. Obviously, it would be less profitable because you're paying a lot more for the soil. But microgreens, luckily, are uh, not like growing corn in a field. They're a very profitable crop. And even if you're paying a bit more for certain items, it still will be a profitable business. But you want to know how much money you're actually making. So definitely recommend that. In terms of other soil, um, the reason I recommend ProMix is because it is one easily available two it's a it's a very good soil it works really well and um, three it's generally pretty cost effective so there's other soils that um, people try but they have some sort of uh, challenge so for example um, if you're using coconut coir it's generally more expensive than promix but maybe not if you're paying 110 dollars a bag uh, but normally you're going to be paying more for pro uh, for coconut coir than promix and if you're buying it in those compressed bales, then it's a huge pain in the butt, to be honest, to uncompress them. Uh, it's a lot of work and it's a lot easier to uncompress a ProMix bale. If you're buying the loose coconut coir, um, there's lots of options available, which is great. Uh, if you're trying to grow certified organic, I personally don't know of a good uh, coconut coir based soil that's loose that you can buy that is available for organic certification. Um, but having said that, there is some products that I've heard uh, good reviews on. They're just more expensive. Like there's a product called Coco Loco, um, which is uh, something I'm going to try hopefully this summer and see how it compares to ProMix. Uh, but having said that, what you don't want to do is use any sort of gardening kind of soil. So you don't want to use a topsoil. You don't want to use a compost. You don't want to use worm castings. You don't want to use those type of things because you're going to have a lot more problems. And it's well worth it to pay for the ProMix than to try to spend less money and get really 
subpar quality soil for microgreens. Now these soils are not necessarily bad soils. They just don't work well for microgreens. I've had so many farms um, that I've worked with over the years switch from using a like compost based soil or a topsoil kind of soil that, uh, that they switch to ProMix and the results are much more consistent, much higher quality. And, um, and if you want to be organic, you can use the ProMix MP. And apparently now there's a ProMix HP organic, which I don't think is commonly available yet, but you can purchase it. Um, it is available from ProMix. So those are some options that are available and I hope that helps. So that's it for today's episode. For anyone that wants to start a microgreens business and hasn't done so yet, there's a really great course that I've, I've created with Freedom Farmers called Start a Microgreens Business from Scratch that gives you everything you need, step-by-step -step instructions on how to start your microgreens business from your home and make $2,000 in 30 days or less. And it has everything you need, including the step-by-step -step, uh, growing guide, a pre-built website, a uh, software from Vertigrow that helps you manage the day-to-day -day tasks, as well as monthly Q and A's and uh, a large, large group of students. I think there's almost 5,000 or just over 5,000 other students that you can ask questions with that have gone through the process before and are now uh, able to help you with uh, your growing process and starting your own business. So if anyone's interested in taking a look at that course, you can watch a free webinar at jonah.freedomfarmers.com and see if it makes sense for you to start your own microgreens business. It's really changed my life. Um, you know, 10 years ago when I started my business and I just took all my information that I knew, put in this course so that you guys can have a much easier time than I did starting a microgreens business. So I hope this AMA helped you on your microgreens journey and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of microgreens businesses and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.